This is a very important moment to be discussing these things because I believe we're at an Augustinian moment. St. Augustine had the privilege and the responsibility of living after 800 years of Roman dominance when Rome fell. And his vision guided the church after the collapse of Rome through the Dark Ages. And here we are today after 500 years of Western dominance and the West is in decline. But the central feature of our time is the global era. And as we look at the global era, the church is exploding in the global south, but not doing well in most of the West. And the simple reason is that the church has become captive to our advanced modern world. Now the challenge of the advanced modern world is coming to the global south. So people need to understand the challenges that the church has not faced well in the West and what is coming to them. And that's the importance of this topic. look at what's gone wrong, you've got to look at it first in terms of the long centuries behind it and then the challenge of our modern world. If you go right back to the early church, in the third century, Eusebius of Caesarea, bishop, very important because he was a historian, he argued that there were two types of Christians, the perfect and the permitted. The perfect, of course, was spiritual, the permitted were the secular people. In other words, the priests, the monks, and the nuns, they were the perfect Christians, dedicated to the Lord, the aristocrats of the soul. And the permitted people were farmers and lawyers and soldiers, people who had children and made a living, and so on. And you had this two-tier universe, full-time, part-time, spiritual, secular. And that was absolutely disastrous because you had the pride and the elite, and then you had the rest of us off the hook, and I'm a lay person. Martin Luther shattered that. It was everyone, everywhere, in everything, including work. So before the Reformation, work was an awful necessity, and the people with wealth and leisure didn't have to work. But the Reformation came along through the teaching of Luther and Calvin going back to the Scriptures. Christ was Lord of everything. Now, if you think for a minute, one thing that unites Jews and Christians and Muslims, in other words, the three families of the book, the Abrahamic family, they all believe in the integration of faith. For Jews, it's under the Torah. For Muslims, it's under the Quran or the Sharia. For us who are followers of Jesus, it's under the Lordship of Jesus. He's Lord of all, including work, or he's not Lord at all. In other words, the Reformation put that right. But sadly, many evangelicals today, many Christians today, are closer to the earlier Catholic distortion than they are to, say, Pope John Paul II, whose teaching was very close to Martin Luther and John Calvin. In other words, the Pope taught that work mattered too, as, of course, Luther did, Calvin did, and the Scriptures do. So we've got to recover that today in our world. Now, that's been made worse because if you look at our modern world, the tendency is what's called privatization. In other words, faith is restricted to the private world, not to the public world and not to the world of work. So there was a famous example of a historian in the 1960s who went round the Californian churches and made the remark, the Christian faith in California is privately engaging, publicly irrelevant. And that's the tragedy of so much of our Western faith. No, thank God that's not true in the global south. I was born in China, and uh, you can see in sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia, the explosion of the church, but as the world becomes more modern, they've got to resist that pressure towards privatization so that faith flourishes in the church, flourishes in the home, but not in the world of work. And that's absolutely disastrous. Because what it does, it takes the salt and the light, which our Lord called us to be, and makes the salt saltless without any savor and restricts the light to the private world. So the gospel becomes a changing power, not only individuals, but societies, 
when it touches everything and it's integrated under the Lordship of Christ, including work. If we want to ask, how do we put this right? I think the single simplest central answer is the biblical notion of calling, calling. Because calling simply means that when God calls us in Jesus, follow me, everything we are, our very being, everything we do, all our actions, and everything we have, our possessions, are now given a dynamic and a direction because they're done as unto him, as a part of our calling. And you can see in history, that's one of the great Christian truths, second only maybe to the cross, putting its stamp on culture and making a very practical difference. So obviously calling includes work. The Reformation was so good at that that people's jobs were described as their vocation, and there was, sadly there was a confusion between occupation and vocation. And we talk even today about vocational aptitude tests or vocational colleges. That was people training for things below the universities. That's unfortunate. But the good part of that was vocation was everything. In Martin Luther's understanding, it was everyone, everywhere, in everything. So it included law and teaching, computer science and homemaking, and politics, everything you can think of, journalism, everything, everyone, everywhere, in everything. And that's the sort of discipleship that we need to go back to today. Now, the Reformers made a lot of very helpful distinctions, and I like to mention those. They talked of the primary call and the secondary call. And there were three parts to the primary call. We're called to know and trust and love our Lord and his Father, and the heart of everything is relationship. But then we're called, secondly, to live his way. We're not called to believe the following ten doctrines. No, we're called to live the way of Jesus. And they were called followers of the way or followers of Jesus, loving our enemies, for example. And then thirdly, to share the faith, the Great Commission. So introduce others to knowing Jesus the way we know him. And all that's part of our primary calling, and every Christian shares that calling. But then there's a secondary calling. And I like to think of three things there based on the parable of the talents and pounds. That includes our giftedness, the gifts we were born with, the things we're good at. It includes our resources. I don't just mean money. Our families and our colleges have given us strengths. Our cultures give us certain things. And then it includes our circles of influence. We're all in touch with certain people, certain family friends, certain neighbors, certain colleagues that nobody else touches. And they are part of our talents and pounds and our calling responsibility. Now put those together. And in the parable Jesus told, the king, the master, gives one, two, five, ten talents. And then they get on with it. They multiply them. They maximize them to his glory. And calling is not like guidance specific. Guidance is specific. Calling is entrepreneurial. There's a vision. There's a venture. There's a risk. And we're to do it on our own responsibility. And that's this notion of calling. So we've got to get people to see work matters. Everything we do in life matters. But we've got to take these talents of our calling before the Lord, like entrepreneurs, and multiply them, maximize them. So whether we've been given one talent, we give back one more. Five talents, five more. Ten talents, ten more. When we see our Lord face to face. And that's the entrepreneurial energy and enterprise of following God's calling in the whole of life. Ideally, <coughs> calling should be taught when someone's 10, 12, 15, or whatever. So we discover a sense of calling before we look for a career. The trouble is many people have chosen a career. It was lucrative. Their parents wanted to do whatever. Everyone was going that way. And then when they're 45 or 50, they have a midlife crisis. They're a square peg in a round hole. Whereas if you have a sense of gifts and calling first and then choose career, then there's a match between it. Now, of course, for many people in our world, say countries like Zambia or Bangladesh, they have no choice. 
And of course, that's true in the Bible times, and it was true at the Reformation. So everything we do is a part of our calling. St. Paul says that the slave slaves for his master as unto the Lord as a matter of calling. So everything we do is a matter of calling, even the mundane, the menial, the humdrum, which we maybe don't want to do, but it raises it, gives it a dignity, because even that is a part of our calling. But people in somewhat wealthier countries who have more of a choice, it's good to try and choose things that fit your gifts and your calling. And then there's incredible joy. Of course, we retire eventually from a job, but you never retire from a calling. And we never finish our callings in this life. We're always following the call because we've heard the voice, follow me. But when we die for the first time, we will see the caller, in other words, the voice we've heard, we'll see the caller face to face. So you retire from a job, or you may at times be unemployed, but you're never out of a calling or retired from a calling. As followers of Jesus, we see everything as he sees it, as God sees it, as the Bible sees it. So you think of people. We brush by thousands of people every day, checkout counters or whatever it is. But as C.S. Lewis said, there are no mere mortals. And we remember everyone is made in the image of God and we can see the splendor of the glory they've had. We treat them differently. And I love the people who know how to do that. And that is a deeply Christian way of dealing with people. And the same is true of work. In other words, we bring a sense of excellence, what Oswald Chambers called my utmost for his highest. So a spreadsheet looks very practical or teach you another class of unruly kids. You know, everything has a dignity and an elevation if we see it under the Lord. So there is no mere work. There is work that we do in an excellent way because we're handing it in to our Lord himself. And that's terribly important. Of course, we've got to avoid the pitfall of perfectionism. And that's the flip side of that. And as G.K. Chesterton used to put it rather well, if a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Now, he didn't mean we do things badly, but we should never be content only with being perfect because that's impossible in a fallen world. But we should bring a sense of excellence into the way we deal with people and into the way we deal with work. As the great Puritan poet uh, George Herbert put it, the person is sweeping the floor, does it as a matter of calling, and it's like the philosopher's stone. In the medieval times, they believed there was a stone, the philosopher's stone, which turned everything to gold. And Milton's saying, I mean, sorry, Herbert is saying, no, no, if you do the simplest, humblest things to the glory of God, spreadsheets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's like the Philosopher's Stone. You're turning them into something that really has excellence in it. And that's a Christian view of people and a Christian view of the dignity of work. Let me put it another way. Modern people are described as other directed. In other words, we're always doing things because we're seen. But the Christians in the New Testament or the Puritans were described as inner directed. They had a, 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 a compass inside them. They'd swallowed gyroscopes, one historian said. The east, south, north, west, right, wrong, true, false was inside them because they were living, as the Puritans put it, before one audience, the audience of one. So we don't just do things that are right because we're seen. We do them because they're right before the Lord. And there's an accountability behind everything we do. And that's incredibly important. We are not living before our families. We're not living before our clients. We're not living before our bosses. We're not living before our colleagues. We're living first and foremost before the Lord. One audience, the audience of one. 
And when we remember that, it gives us a standard of excellence. It gives us a standard of accountability that today's world simply doesn't have. Other directed, and often when people are invisible, they're not accountable. And that's one of the reasons for the ethical crisis. We're not seen, and so we don't behave the way we would when we're seen. We are always seen. We're before one audience, the audience of one. 